Welcome to Wayne's Old Time Radio Page channel. I'm Wayne, your host. These programs are brought to you by support of our listeners. You can give your support at Patreon or PayPal, either one. There's clickable links in the description below. Thanks for your support. Enjoy the shows. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is the operator. Ready with your call to Mr. Pat Kelleher in Baltimore. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello, Pat. I got your wire. What's all this? What happened? We're still trying to find out. The man calling himself Frank Bowers was killed an hour ago. George Hanley, one of the operatives I had watching him, was killed too. We've got a vague description of the killer. Are you all right? Yeah, but I'm going to be tied up with the police here. Well, you need money for bail or anything like that, just draw a draft on the company. I'll confirm it. Thanks, Pat. Too bad about your friend. Yeah, he was a good guy. I want to find out who killed him. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account continued. Item 13, a quarter for some aspirin. It turned out to be a long night. Several homicide officers arrived at the double murder scene within a matter of minutes and got right down to the business at hand. Frank Bowers had been shot to death. George Hanley had been shot to death. Lieutenant Tom O'Neill was in charge, a big blonde man who seemed to know what he was about. Okay, let's see that ID again. There you go. Ah, insurance investigator, hmm? That's right. Okay. What was your business here with these two men? My home office in Baltimore had reason to believe that Frank Bowers was really a man named John Reardon. Reardon was supposed to have died five years ago. I was sent out here to investigate it since there had been a $20,000 claim in the matter. Sure, sure. I hired George Hanley to help me out. He was keeping an eye on Frank Bowers. I came out earlier tonight to give my hand and the shooting began. Any idea who did it? A big man in a top coat and a hat. I really didn't get a look at him, Lieutenant. I was busy with George Hanley. Sure. You carry a gun? Sometimes. I didn't have one tonight. You tried to chase the killer? I said I was busy with my friend. That's right, you did. Well, how was your investigation coming along? Frank Bauer's fingerprints didn't match the samples I had for John Reardon. But it didn't satisfy me. There were a lot of things about him personally I couldn't accept. I harassed him a little last night, and he got pretty excited and slugged me. This was after I found out he'd been trying to call Baltimore. Who in Baltimore? I don't know. Well, tell me about this harassing. You'll make a check with the phone company. Well, I needled him purposely, trying to scare him into a blunder. I think I was doing pretty good. I'll never know now. Uh-huh. What else you got to say about your case? Well, that's about it, Lieutenant. It is, huh? Well, that's all I got to say because that's all I know about it. Next time, be careful with your needling tactics. Boy. I was doing what I thought best on the case. Sure you were. You were doing swell. You let a friend of yours get shot down in front of your eyes. Not to mention the other guy. You can't give us a description of the killer or a hint at the motive. Now, maybe George Hanley wasn't a friend of yours at that. Why, you... Dad, take it easy, kiddo. Take it easy. Remember to blow the bell. I'm sorry. You've had quite a night. Nobody in your business or mine knows what's behind the door when he kicks it in. I'm just a cop trying to get straightened out, so I push too hard sometimes. We'll get it taken care of. Nobody walks in a man's house and shoots him down without somebody hearing something or seeing something. I mean, somebody besides you. Now, my men will cover every house in the block, in this whole area if we have to. Bound to be somebody somewhere. The dogged Lieutenant O'Neill turned out to be 100% correct. In fact, he turned out to be 300% correct. For by 11 o'clock the following morning, his men had located three different people who had information about the brutal murders of Frank Bowers and George Hanley. The first was a man named Randall who had lived across the street. He had seen Bowers open his front door and admit the unknown killer. He said he wore glasses. The second was a paper boy who had come to collect while the killer was there. He stated that the killer and Bowers were arguing when he came up to the door. The third witness, a housewife, gave the most important information as to the man's description. He was a good deal taller than Mr. Bowers. How much taller? Mm, Three, four inches at least. I saw him standing in the doorway from here. He had on a brown tweed top coat. My husband has one just like it. How old would you say he was? Mm, Forty-five. Have you ever seen him before? No. Would you know him if you saw him again? Yes, anywhere. You got that good look at him, huh? Yes, the porch light was on. 
Here's something, Dollar. Lieutenant O'Neill had issued an all-points bulletin based on the combined descriptions given by the witnesses. In the meantime, his men had checked the local cab companies and found out that one of the drivers had carried a fare to Frank Bauer's home at 8 o'clock in the evening. The cab driver verified the housewife's description of the suspect and added the important information that he'd picked up the man at the airport. When that was checked, it was found the man had come in on a plane from the east at 5.45 in the afternoon. He had used the name Oren Williams. Expense account item 14, $8.95. Another long-distance phone call to Baltimore and Pat Kelleher. Well, I'll be darned. Do you have to stay there, John? Of course I have to stay here. I'm a material witness. Not to mention the fact that a pal of mine was shot down. Don't get on your high horse, John. It was just a question. Have any idea what it was all about? Well, at the moment, I'm just sure a guy named Oren Williams flew in, shot up two people, and beat it. If we had Williams, I'd give you the whole thing on a silver platter. You're awfully touchy. Well, this thing has gotten out of hand. Well, I won't press you on it anymore, John. You do what you think is best. As far as the company's concerned, it's really not our business anymore, is it? It's our business until it's cleared up. Well, I mean Bowers. He wasn't John Reardon. Dollar? Hold it, Pat. Yeah? Answer from Washington on your wire. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Here. Let me see. Pat. Yeah? It is our business after all. Huh? The lieutenant here sent a hurry-up request to Washington on some of Bowers' fingerprints I mailed a couple of days ago. They check out. I don't get it. Bowers was John Reardon. Oh. Well. Well, where'd you get the samples of Reardon's prints that didn't check out? From Hugh Bryan, Reardon's attorney. I better call him. Don't you dare. Don't open your mouth. I'll handle it when I get there. Tell me about this fellow, Hugh Bryan. According to the phone company... That's the man Bowers was trying to call in Baltimore. I told him all I knew, and Lieutenant O'Neill listened thoughtfully. It became apparent from that point on, since Bowers' true identity had been established through Army records, that the bulk of the case could be concluded not in Denver, but in Baltimore. Expense account item 16, $216, plane fare and incidentals, Denver to Baltimore. I arrived at 10.15 in the evening, checked with the Baltimore police who had been informed of the case by Tom O'Neill in Denver. At his request, they'd taken no action as yet. From the police station, I went directly to Hugh Bryan's residence. The house was English, conservative, and expensive. The fire in the living room looked cheerful when the door opened. Elizabeth Reardon did not look so cheerful. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Mrs. Reardon. Didn't expect to find you here. No, I suppose not. I never expected to see you again. Elizabeth, I have something to tell you. Don't tell me now, John. It's about your husband. All right. I want to tell Mr. Bryan, too. He's upstairs in his study. Oh, wait. Look, I've done what I thought best about all this, and I'm trying to do what's best now. It doesn't make any difference, Johnny. I'm a married woman again. Huh? Yes. You and I were married this morning. Excuse me. I walked in and watched John Reardon's widow, alias Frank Bauer's widow, now Hugh Bryan's bride, disappear up a column stairway. The news that she had married Hugh Bryan cleared up some of the small doubts in my mind. When Bryan came back down the stairs with her, he looked anything but the happy bridegroom. Hello, Dollar. You're a late caller. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, how did you come out in Denver? Everything okay? No, everything's not okay. Well, uh, what's the matter? Do I have to tell you? I'll run along upstairs, Hugh. It's getting terribly late. All right, dear. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mrs. Bryan. There'll be some men out to see you pretty soon, Bryan. Policemen. Oh. Liz. Yes, dear? I think you'll be interested in what Mr. Dollar has to say. I don't understand you. I wasn't in Philadelphia yesterday, Liz. I was in Denver, Colorado. What? I flew there to see John. He's been alive and living there all this time. Hugh. I'm sorry. This is only for her benefit, Dollar. I'll tell it just once. When it gets into court, it'll be different. How did it happen, Brian? John Reardon didn't die in that boat. No. He was picked up in a bay by a fishing boat on his way to Florida. They didn't have a radio on the fishing boat. 
The first port they came to was Charleston. John phoned me from there and told me all about it. Now, this was ten days after we all thought he was dead. That part was all accident. Sure. The rest of it was a little different. Liz, it was his idea. You've got to believe that. What was his idea? Not showing up ever again. Letting everyone think he was really dead. Making you a widow. I don't believe it. He hated his life here. Yes, I... everything about it. He was in debt right up to his ears. Of course, there was your money, but he... Well, I flew down to Charleston to talk to him. He was like a crazy man. Kept saying there was a way out. I didn't know what he meant at first. Then he came right out and said it was his chance to get away from all the things he hated. He knew how I felt about you then, how I feel about you now. He said I could have you for a price. What was the price? Those checks he got every week from a New York bonding concern? Yes. What did they come to? 25000 a year, regular weekly payments. I could afford it. I could afford anything for you, Liz. Did he come right out and tell you he hated me? He just said he wanted to get away from everything. And it went that way for five years. I believe I asked you to marry me every six months. Yes. But that didn't work out either. And then, one day, along came Johnny Dollar. How does it feel to be so efficient, Mr. Dollar? We don't have to go into that, do we? No. I'll admit you did everything to throw me off. And it threw me off. Especially the fingerprints you provided. Didn't John Reardon insist his name was Frank Bowers and do everything he could to make you believe that was true? He did too much to make me think it was true. Where is he now? Where's John? He's dead, Mrs. Bryan. Oh. Truly dead now. He was shot to death last night by Mr. Bryan. Mr. Bryan also shot a friend of mine, didn't you, Bryan? Yes. John got scared, called me, said he was going to tell everything to Dollar, blow the whole thing. You... All I wanted out of this was you, Liz. He didn't want you. I did. Last week, you decided to marry me. It took you five years to do that. And it took him one afternoon to decide he was going to come back to you. The proof that John Reardon's widow is guilty or not guilty of a fraudulent insurance claim is a matter for Eastern Fidelity to decide. The matter of Hugh Bryan and two murders is a matter for the courts. Expense account, item 17, same as item 1. Expenses from Baltimore to Hartford. Item 18, $89 even. Car rentals, miscellaneous, etc. Expense account total, $1,124.98. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, a quiet, sleepy little town in Mexico and a beautiful senorita that... Well, things didn't stay quiet and sleepy for long. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gene Bates, D.J. Thompson, High Everback, Will Wright... John Daner, Tony Barrett, Paul Dubov, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>